Couldn't you just feel that? Yeah, just something rising in that truth. It's, it's as is it, that one power and one presence is so seeking to be recognized and for us to recognize that even though we may look different, even though we may have different opinions, even though we like, like different things, there's one power, one love, one spirit expressing through, in and through and as all of us. And so we dedicate this day in the name of that one power. And that power is our very life. We know it best as love. God is spirit and God is love. And we know ourselves that we have the capacity, you know, the body of work called A Course in Miracles, if you distill it down, it's basically saying this. At all times and in all ways, we are either being an expression of love or we are crying for love. We are either being that spark of love or we are so broken and seeking for love that there's a cry coming out from us. I believe our world is crying and I believe our world is also rising up in the name of love, that we are that presence and power if we allow that to be what comes through us, what animates us. And so today we talk about that one power and our relationship, you know, the greatest relationship we all have is with our true nature, with the God of our being, and that God is expressed through our divinity, our true nature. And so you can say the greatest relationship we have is with our own true nature. And a lot is learned about ourselves by the things that we say. You know, no matter who we're talking to, what we're talking about, what we're saying, the greatest thing we're saying and the greatest thing that can be learned by what we're saying is it says a lot about us. Our words are very revealing. There's a funny story about a man who walked into a grocery store and he went over to the produce department and he found a young boy working there and he said, I want to buy half of a head of cabbage. And the young boy said, sir, we only, well, I'm pretty sure we only sell a whole cabbage. We don't sell half a cabbage. And the man said, well, I don't want a whole cabbage. I just want a half a cabbage. Do whatever you need to do. I just want to buy a half a cabbage. And so the young boy said, well, let me go talk to my manager. And so he walked over and found the manager of the produce department. He said, some idiot is asking to buy half a head of cabbage. And he noticed the man had followed him over there. <laughs> and he said, and this kind man is asking to buy the other half. <laughs> <laughs> The store manager chuckled, they went out, and he said, well, son, you're pretty sharp and fast on your feet there, aren't you? He said, you're a new employee, you haven't been here long, where are you from? And the young man said, well, I just moved here from Canada. And he said, really, I heard that's a beautiful place, why'd you move from Canada? He said, oh, you wouldn't like Canada, the only people that live in Canada are crooks and criminals and hockey players. And the man said, really, my wife is from Canada. <laughs> And the young boy said, really, what team did she play on? <laughs> <laughs> Hence the saying, oh, what a tangled web we weave. <laughs> that if you've uh, started lying or you're, you're not saying things, that it, it gets bigger. It's like the snowball effect that just begins to grow and that the power of our words and what we're saying, why we're saying what we're saying and how we're saying it, when we're saying it, is all very, very important because it leads us back to ourself as a creative being. And so we really want to explore that today. I was thinking about how often we, we say things like, oh, don't say that. You know, you may tell someone, don't say that out loud. You could incriminate yourself. You could get in trouble. Don't say that. Or if you hear someone say something like, I just hate them, I just wish they'd fall off the end of the earth, you may say, well, don't say that, meaning you don't really believe that, you don't really mean that. Or how many of you have heard a young child say, I just hate myself, I'm so stupid or I'm so ugly. And it, you would kneel down to that child and say, honey, you're beautiful, don't say that. We, we use that term, don't say that, because we realize if the person is saying that, they must believe it somewhere. And by saying it, it brings it to a whole nother level of reality, realness, becoming real. My father really made an impression on me when I was probably 14, 15, anyway, a teenager, starting really going into that um, 
kind of defiant stage that when teenagers are finding their self. And I grew up in a Pentecostal home and I learned a lot of scripture. And so as I got older, I learned to use it against my parents. <laughs> I'd parent it back and say, well, Jesus said, or the Bible says. <laughs> and they say, well, I said. <laughs> but I remember one time I, was, I said something and it was just my father and me. And he said, darling, don't say that. And I said, well, the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so if I'm thinking it, Daddy, I may as well say it. <laughs> and he said, there's a different level of reality there. He said, if a police officer stops you, you may think to yourself, you are an ugly, mean, blah, 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 fill in the blank. He said, but Darlene, is there a difference if you say it out loud to him? And I said, I understand your point, Daddy. <laughs> There's a, that when we say something out loud, it takes on a whole new level of reality. We know that. And so the Buddhists talk about right speech, but not right speech in, from the sense of that you should censor yourself. Because I'm not saying you know, don't speak your truth. This is all about, you have to put this in perspective. And so it's not about censorship as much as it is about intentionality. Why are you saying what you are saying? What is your intention? Do you believe it? Because there's power. Our words have power. In the Aramaic language, the word abrik, it talks about um, our speech. And there's an Aramaic saying that says, I will create as I speak. I will create as I speak. And the root of that word, abrac, is the foundation of the saying, abracadabra, that it comes from, I will create as I speak. And so the ancients really knew there were power in the words. Um, the, the, in the Jewish faith, they did not even speak the name of God because God was so great because they knew whatever you said out of your mouth, you were bringing something to a whole nother level of creation. Well, today in our society, especially in the Western world, we are so bombarded with words and media and talking and noise. And we really, we begin to, we become dismissive and sort of minimize the fact that what we say is more than just babbling, that what we say, there's power in those words. And so today, I hope we can use this as an opportunity to pull that energy back in some, to realize I'm a creative being, and let me learn from the very things that I'm saying, and let me use the power of my word to create. You see, you are a creator. At all times, you can hurt or heal, and it is true with our words. And so at all times, we are speaking blessings or we're speaking curse. We're lifting up or we're tearing down. We're speaking from a place of wholeness or we're speaking from a place of brokenness and so the power of our words can lead us back to the realization I am whole and so are you we may not be showing up from the awareness of that right now but let us claim it and speak it and begin to move in a direction that is more light and more loving the scriptures have a lot to say about the power of our word and not just the Christian scriptures would you give me the first slide in the Buddhist tradition it says a person is born with an axe in his mouth he whose speech is unwholesome cuts himself with the ax. Another text in Buddhism said, the word, your word is your poison or your word is your nourishment. They both speak to this. In Islam, it says, the messenger of God took hold of his tongue and said, we feign this. <laughs> that, that, that sometimes we just need to take a hold of our tongue and say, restrain this. <laughs> that we can do so much with our tongue. And then if you look in the Old Testament in Proverbs, the power of life and death are in the tongue. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. And then in the Gospel of Matthew, the New Testament, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. For what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. You see, Jesus was saying that what overflows from our heart overflows from, and it comes out of our mouth. And so if there's brokenness or bitterness, that's what comes out. If there's love and connection and wholeness, that's what's going to come out. In the very first book, Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God's created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was void and without form, and the winds, the spirit began to move, and God said, 
let there be light. And God said, God's first act of creation was the spoken word, that it was through word that the image, the likeness, the form took expression. If you look up definition of word, used to express meaning, the principal carrier of ideas, that word takes an idea and clothes it with vibration, with sound. That's why many people say that the beginning of the world was OM, that it's sound, because sound is vibration. We know that through music. Uh, back in the 70s, there were several studies done with music and plants. And some of the plants, they played hard rock music and, the, and surrounded the plants with the speakers. On, around one side and those plants literally grew away from the speakers even the roots grew away from the speakers and the petunias would not bloom then they took classical music in another room and did the exact same thing some of the plants even wrapped themselves around the speakers they so loved it and the petunias just bloomed and so they knew that vibration there's been a lot of studies done with with vibration and with sound from using sand to water crystals and different things so we know that the power of the spoken word is a part of our creative potential there was a um, a new thought teacher sharing a message very similar to this talking about the power of our word and how it is part of our creative nature and a man in the audience stood up and he said you know I don't believe that I can say I'm blessed and it doesn't mean anything I can say I'm cursed it doesn't mean anything there's no power in words and the teacher said shut up and sit down you old fool you don't know what you're talking about and the audience gasped and the man's face turned red and the teacher said, I didn't mean to offend you, but do you understand the power of words <laughs> does have an impact? <laughs> that we can say it doesn't matter, but it does. The power of word has an incredible impact to uplift or not. And so when we think about the power of words, there's a tradition that is it's attributed to Rumi. It's found in, in many different traditions. And it talks about this. It says, before you speak, let your words pass through three gates. Before you speak, let your words pass through three gates. And at the gate, at the first gate, ask yourself, is this true? Is it true? You know, in our society, I think we're trained figure out how to kind of finagle the truth. We have things called white lies. <laughs> that it's, If it's a white lie, if it's not really true, but we have to ask ourselves, why do I do that? Again, not from a place of judgment, but if we have difficulty speaking our truth, why? The great Carol King, the singer-songwriter, talked about when, when she, was, uh, she had her first song published when she was 17 years old. Great musician. She's written so many songs that we know. When she was taking voice lessons, they told her, your voice is too hoarse, you know, you, you, you just, you need to keep practicing, you can't sing. And so for years, she wouldn't sing until James Taylor encouraged her, lifted her up, and got her to go out and sing. And she writes about that in her autobiography. She also tells about her third marriage, that she married a man that she really believed loved her because he just followed her, he did everything with her. He would even, she tells about even if she got her hair, her nails done, he would be there waiting. But what happened over a period of time is he began to be verbally abusive and she had no air, no breathing room. And little by little by little, she said she couldn't write. She totally lost touch with who she was. And one day she had to wake up and ask herself, who am I? Where is my voice gone? And she realized she was no longer true to herself. She wasn't even in touch with her truth. She wound up getting therapy and moving on to another relationship. But she said her creativity literally shut down when she couldn't live in her own truth. And so asking ourselves, is it true? You know, when we tell a lie, whatever we broadcast, there's weight that goes with that. I remember when I was a kid, my parents were hardworking, they still are. And my father gave this incredible present, birthday present to my mom one year. He bought her a beautiful oak dining room table. And this table was delivered with the chairs and my sister and I were only 18 months apart. We, the whole family thought, wow, this is an incredible table. Well, one day apparently I climbed up on the table with my bare feet and walked around. Not sure why, but later that day, my mom found footprints on her new dining room table. 
Well, my sister and I, as I said, are only 18 months apart, and then my cousin Eddie, who was a few years younger, we were all three there, and she said, who was walking on the dining room table? I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> not, wasn't me. And, and none of us knew anything about it, of course, and so she said, all right, every one of you stand up on this table, and she started measuring footprints. <laughs> She's a wise woman. My sister's footprint fit. <laughs> felt terrible <laughs> but not terrible enough to tell the truth <laughs> and so I watched her be punished and then I felt really bad but still not quite bad enough to tell the truth because you know then it's like oh my god I've created this how do I and so I just remember feeling horrible about it for years I mean I'm in my 50s and I still remember feeling horrible about that well <laughs> A few years ago, my family was on a vacation, and we started telling things, and I thought, we're <laughs> safe now. And so I brought that up, the new dining room table, and everybody, oh yeah, we all remember that. And I told my sister, I said, I, Shelly, I feel so bad. It was me, I walked on the table. She said, really, I walked on it too that day. <laughs> possessed us both to walk on the table that day but but for years you know I carried that and it's you know we don't realize the impact some after the first service people told me all stories about their funny lies as kids it's good stories but there's a, a Native American tradition where they used to teach you know children go through the that age of fabricating and making stuff up you know I remember one time being with my little brother he was about four and it was thundering outside and I said Sam what is that he said I saw what it was it's God killing elephants back there in the woods <laughs> you know, kids make stuff up but as they get older if they continue to lie in the Native American tradition what they would do they would send the child to the chief the chief would say give him a bag of feathers and say go to every house and leave a feather and pick up a stone every house leave a feather and pick up the stone and come to me tomorrow morning so the next day the young child would would go back to the chief and and say the chief said okay now I want you to go back take your stones with you and I want you to pick up all the feathers and bring the feathers and the stones back to me well the child would come back and most of the feathers had blown away but the stones they're still dragging the stones around and the chief would say, I want you to remember that so it is with your words. You may not see your words, but your words will go out. You can never take your words back. But the impact of your word, the spirit of your word, is going to fly away and fly out there and be forever gone with your imprint on it. But the weight of your words, you must be able to live with the weight of your words. And so for us to ask ourselves, the first gate, is it true? And if it's not true, then what is, what is it within me that doesn't make me think that I can be honest? And then to be with that and invite yourself to be in that space of allowing yourself to be able to be true. So the first gate, is it true? The second gate, is it kind? How many of you grew up in a home and sort of like the highest denominator, the biggest thing that mattered was be nice and get along? be nice and I can even remember you know being told now act 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 nice and so we all it was we knew we were acting nice I think in the south we're really taught that it's like we we say bless your heart they are such a mess good lord <laughs> it's act nice well there's nothing wrong with being nice but there's a big difference and distinction between nice and kind you see you can act nice but kindness is a part of compassion. Compassion is an intention. Compassion is also tough love. Compassion is that that says, I will not enable you in your drug use any longer. I will not remain in this dysfunctional relationship any longer. I will not. Some people may say, well, that's not nice. We're not talking about nice. We're talking about kind. And kind is compassionate and loving, and love must speak the truth. And the truth sometimes hurts. The truth is sometimes hard. And so when you ask yourself, is it kind? 
to be kind and compassionate, to love yourself and to love that person enough to hold them in the light and to say the same light of God that is in me is in you. And I'm not going to act like I can be your God or I can be my own God, that we're going to do what is kind and compassionate and true. It's very powerful when we begin to do this because our words are either building up or our words are tearing down at all times. I read the story of a man who he and his wife moved here from India. They waited. They were a little bit older before they had their first child, and their first child was a little boy. This father traveled a lot, was hardworking, successful. And one day he came home, and he started to go in his son's room to say, Hi, Daddy's home. And the little four-year-old was sitting there with crayons coloring on the wall. And he went, ah, 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 you know, don't do that. Are you stupid? You don't color on the walls. Stop that. And the little child just got really rigid and jumped. And so a week or two later, the same thing. He walks by and the kid's coloring on the wall again. Ah, ah, don't do that. And he just really strikes out at the child. So he was disturbed that his son didn't get the point. He's coloring on the walls again. So he happens to have a phone conversation with his mother back in India. And he's telling his mother about it. And his mother chuckles. She says, he says, why are you laughing? She said, son, you had that same spirit when you were a little boy. You always wanted to express. You needed to do your own thing. And if anybody tried to tell you not to do that, you just did it more. But son, you always also responded to love and to kind words. And she said, son, you are his father. You are his role model. And your words right now are either building him up or tearing him down. You're either creating windows or you're creating walls. And it's your job to be able to speak to him in such a way that guides him, but also helps him see the young man that he's becoming. And so the next time when he comes home and he walks by, this time not only is his son coloring, but he looks at his dad and kind of smiles like, yeah, I'm doing it again. <laughs> and he said it was all he could do not to lose it, but he walked over and he leaned down and he said, Hey, son, will you stand up? Wow, look how tall you are. Stand up as tall as you can. He said, you have grown an inch since I saw you last. Do you know your daddy's little boy? You have becoming such a little man, your daddy's little boy. And you know what? Little boys don't color on the wall. Little boys know how to write on paper. So let's you and I clean it up and we'll get some paper. And he said, my son never drew on the walls again. Because he lifted him up, he called him higher to say, I see you like this. Can you hold that and see that for yourself? And so kindness, we have such power with our words. Is it true? Is it kind? And then finally, is it necessary? How often do we talk just because we're uncomfortable? How often do we talk just because we don't know why? We're just talking. <laughs> Gandhi, there's a, a beautiful quote by Mahatma Gandhi that says, Richard, would you give me that song? Speak only if it improves upon the silence. Speak only if it improves upon the silence. There's a story about a, a husband and wife when you ask, is it necessary? This woman wrote, after my husband and I had a huge argument, we ended up not talking to each other for almost two days. Finally, my husband asked me where was one of his shirts. I said, oh, so now you're speaking to me. He looked confused and said, what are you talking about? Haven't you noticed we haven't spoken for almost two days? He said, no, I just thought we were getting along. <laughs> is, it, is it kind? Is it true? Is it necessary? I've been practicing this you know, some this week, really bringing mindfulness to, is it necessary? And I've learned about myself, I think I have a lot to offer, even when not asked. <laughs> that, that, that when you try to pay attention, and you don't have to laugh so hard. <laughs> that, that when you try to pay attention to, why am I saying this? Did they, are they asking for my help right now? Are they asking for my opinion? Is there any discomfort with the silence? What am I afraid may come up if you and I just sit in the silence? 
Have you ever noticed in a car or someone or someone cutting your hair and it gets silent and you start thinking, I wonder what they're thinking about. I wonder what they're, what should I say now? I wonder what they're thinking about. That, why is that? So is it necessary? This week I encourage you to bring mindfulness to realize that the power and presence of God is expressed in and through and as you. And the voice, that vibration that you use to send out, it is a medium that conveys a spirit. And that spirit is a light and live and well. That spirit affirms life and speak truth. That spirit carries the vibration of compassion or not. Those words are always building windows of connection, windows that I can see more, that you can see more, or those words are building walls. And so as we bring mindfulness, is it true, is it kind, and is it necessary? I invite you to go enter into that practice this week that you may strengthen your relationship with your true nature. And so the song we're going to use that will guide us into a time of meditation says, I am that I am has sent me. That the great I am has sent each and every one of us to be the voice, to be the hands, to be the presence of spirit. If you know the song, join in with me. I am that I am has sent me to this now moment. Here I am, I am that I am, has sent me to this now moment, and here I am, to be the voice, and to be the Be. Mm-hmm.